When you think of the Everglades, you probably think of a vast, untamed wilderness full of stagnant swamps, slithering reptiles, and stinging insects. For the most part, that's an accurate description. Covering about 1.5 million acres, the Everglades is enormous. The watery landscapes teem with critters. Reptiles and insects are plentiful, as well as millions of fish, birds, and other wildlife. But the subtropical wetlands that define the Everglades bioregion are anything but stagnant. In fact, most people would be surprised to learn that the Everglades is actually considered to be an enormous, slow-moving river. The Everglades is an incredibly unique ecosystem, full of toothy sawgrass and nurtured by a slow-moving river, 40 miles wide and over 100 miles long. Sadly, a century of human population growth and development has taken a major toll on the river of grass. Today we are dealing with the effects of an altered, unnatural system. To understand how the river of grass should work, we need to head way north to the Kissimmee River. During the rainy season, rainfall in the higher central part of Florida fills a chain of lakes just south of Orlando. These lakes feed into the Kissimmee River, which flows south dumping into the Great Lake Okeechobee. In its natural state, Lake Okeechobee would brim over during the rainy season, spilling the excess water over its southern rim. From an airplane or satellite image, we can see how this southward sheet flow of water has shaped the hammock islands that dot the Everglades into a flowing pattern of teardrop shapes. The Everglades is dominated by watery prairies and sawgrass marsh about ankle to knee deep during the rainy season. Here and there we see tree islands on high ground, cypress domes in deeper areas, and ponds or sloughs where the water is deepest. As it nears its final destination, the Everglades becomes a maze of mangrove estuaries. The water here should be brackish, or a mixture of salt water from the sea and fresh water from the land. At last, the Everglades dumps its contents into Florida Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. And this is where the long journey ends for the Everglades, River of Grass. At least, that's the way it's supposed to work. But as I mentioned earlier, the Everglades has been tampered with. Water, its lifeblood, no longer flows the way it should, and the Everglades is dying of thirst. This spells catastrophe for a place like Florida Bay, which is naturally brackish estuary, a nursery ground for fish, and home to the largest meadows of seagrass in the world. Today, during periods of drought, Florida Bay can actually become saltier than the sea. This is exactly what happened in the summer of 2015, sending the system into shock and killing more than 50,000 acres of seagrass. What's next? Algae blooms, dead fish, and a fishing industry in crisis. No more than eight months later, Florida experienced an unusually rainy winter. Lake Okeechobee filled to dangerously high levels, and billions of gallons of nutrient-rich water were dumped out to sea. This water didn't flow and filter through the river of grass as it did for eons of time. Instead, it was pumped out of Lake Okeechobee through two huge man-made canals, one flowing west to the Clusahatchee River and the other flowing east into the St. Lucie River and the Indian River Lagoon estuary. Billions of gallons a day of polluted lake water poured into these brackish estuaries for nearly a year, altering salinity patterns and killing critical nursery habitats like seagrass meadows and oyster reefs. By the summer, conditions became disastrous. Fueled by excessive nitrogen and phosphorus levels, a 200 square mile bloom of toxic blue-green algae appeared on the surface of Lake Okeechobee. Transported by the torrent of water being dumped out of the lake, this algae bloom made its way to the St. Lucie River and Indian River Lagoon estuary, coating the shorelines in a thick layer of toxic green slime. The result? An environmental catastrophe. So why is the plumbing all messed up? Well, over a hundred years ago, an effort began to drain the water from the Everglades. Today, a vast network of canals, pumps, and locks are used to divert water away from the glades, leaving behind a huge area of dry, fertile ground, perfect for growing crops like sugarcane all year. The Everglades Agricultural Area, or EAA as it is called, sits on what used to be the marshy beginning of the river of grass. You'll remember that historically, Lake Okeechobee would overflow its southern rim, right where the Everglades agricultural area is today, giving birth to the river of grass. 
That all stopped in the early 1900s with the construction of an earthen dam, later replaced by a massive wall that now almost completely surrounds the lake. The Herbert Hoover Dyke is important for flood control. It protects thousands of residents in surrounding towns from deadly storm surges. Unfortunately, however, it cuts off the main water supply to the River of Grass. Through Everglades restoration, freshwater flow can be restored to the River of Grass. This would relieve pressure from a dammed and swollen Lake Okeechobee, removing the need to pump that polluted water out to sea and saving important estuaries like the St. Lucie River and Indian River Lagoon. This would be accomplished in part by buying back portions of the Everglades agricultural area to create water storage and filter marshes south of Lake Okeechobee. The Everglades is a shadow of what it used to be, but it's incredibly important to us. The River of Grass recharges our aquifer, providing fresh water for more than four million people. It's also really important for our economy, attracting over a million visitors each year and supporting a billion dollar recreational fishing industry. These are just a few reasons why Everglades restoration has to happen.